Alrighty, this is the Celtics Lab Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Cook Dubai. I'm joined by Alex Goldberg of Divine Sweater, the music you heard at the top, or maybe heard at the Sinclair this week. I'm joined by Dr. Justin <laughs> Quinn. We are going to talk about the late great Bill Russell, and to do that, we welcome in from the New York Times, Sophan Deb. Sophan, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, the pleasure's all ours. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I was going to say, not the happiest of topics, but I think there's a lot of celebration in the world um, with the passing of Bill Russell. It's obviously um, a sad few days, and our thoughts are with his friends and family, but there is a lot to celebrate. Um, so maybe I won't decide that the mood is somber right away. Um, so, so fun. You wrote a, a really nice piece for the New York Times I want to get into um, way back when you kind of shine light on the story behind the statue at City Hall Plaza we would like to talk about. Um, we've got some history nerds on the pod, so we'll talk about all of that. But let's just go around the horn. Uh, so fun, your immediate reaction to Bill's passing and, and the, the outreach and the outpouring of condolences that followed. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously it's it's tragic in, in, in the respect of, you know, anytime someone passes away. Um, but Bill Russell was 88 and he lived in that 88 years. He made such an indelible, how many people in the world living today can match the impact that Bill Russell had in, in the nearly, you know, 90 years that he he was on this planet. Um, and it was really amazing in the in the 24 hours after, you know, his his passing was announced to see all the how many people he touched, how many, if you look at a lot of um, the activism we see today, we saw after the George Floyd protests, um, after, you know, you know, in the, in the wake of a lot of, let's say, police shootings in the last, you know, 10 years or so, they're all, they're all doing it in part because you can draw a straight line from what Bill Russell did to now. And, and the, other, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting was, um, it's not like Bill Russell's activism stopped, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, he, he was politically active, you know, until the very end. Um, he was supportive of Colin Kaepernick, you know, as recently, you know, in the last couple of years and Colin, so, you know, speaking up for Kaepernick is, is kind of in vogue now, mm-hmm. right. In, in, you know, three years ago, it really wasn't. And, and, but not that that's ever mattered to Bill Russell, what's in vogue and what's not. And, you know, I'm just, um, look, the man, regardless of where you stand on who the greatest basketball player is of t- all time, regardless of that, I think it's, it's pretty fair to say that Bill Russell is the most consequential basketball player in history, not because of his on-court exploits, but just what he was able to accomplish off the court. You know, Bill, you know, you, you know Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, that's kind of one and two in whatever order you want to put in, in my, in my humble opinion. So, um, yeah, I was just, I was just struck by just the, the magnitude of the life he lived, which was just so rare for a professional athlete, you know, for a lot of professional athletes, they leave their, their fame begins and ends with what they do on the court or on the field with Bill Russell. It was, that was the beginning. What he did on the floor was the beginning of his impact, which to that end is so wild because he's also he has 11 yeah, right. rings. It's yeah. not like amazing player. Like yeah. he was all, like even if you even if he didn't march once, you know, even if he didn't say a single thing about about, you know, uh the civil rights movement. He would still be one of the greatest basketball players in the history, one of the greatest professional athletes that's ever lived. And it's yeah. amazing that he's able to match that legacy off the playing field. That that's unheard of. Dr. Quinn, I know uh you felt I, mean, I think we all did. You felt pretty emotional after this. Can you give us your 30 seconds on how you felt? Uh, you know, I didn't expect to to be all teary-eyed in the car on the way back from a trip for uh, my wife and I's anniversary, but I, I made her promise to let me show her uh, uh, his, his uh, documentary, uh, My Life, My Way. I think it's called something like that. And I, I saw in her face, she's not an NBA fan. And she's like, oh God, more NBA bullshit. <laughs> and, uh, by the time, by the time that we were done watching, she, she really did get it. And that, that was, you know, one hour, one account of his life. And there's so, so much more. Uh, now, after some time has passed, I'm, I'm, I won't say happy, but I, I'm celebratory. I, I'm really, I'm, I'm enjoying seeing that, 
he is finally really being revealed to new generations of people who really had little to no idea of who he was, like who he was more than some guy who had 11 rings in the era of plumbers and firemen and all that stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. Alex, what about you? Well, it's interesting, you know, like, but like all of you, I was, you know, immediately quite emotional when uh, I saw the bill had passed, but it's true. And I think Sopan, you described quite eloquently like, how just big of a presence Bill Russell was in American life. And so um, after I saw that, I ended up just kind of going down a YouTube rabbit hole and watching some old Bill Russell footage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bill Russell, the activist, is a mammoth presence. I made a tweet the other day saying I think he should be remembered as not just, a you know, a basketball player, but arguably one of the most important Americans who's ever lived. Um, but it, to that end, you know, focusing on just the basketball for a second, in watching those highlights, what stood out to me is that uh, it's kind of exactly what you said. Like people really need to, if they haven't, take the time to educate themselves on what Bill Russell was able to do on the court, because Bill Russell on the court was a monster. Like there are a handful of players ever who can have that kind of an impact on a game to game basis. I think the claim that he is the best defender ever and the book is kind of open and shut on that is pretty accurate based on the footage and the stats and the other stuff. Obviously, it's really hard to compare eras. I grant that, you know, the league has changed a lot then. But if you just look at like the timing, the instincts, the awareness, and like the thing that stood out to me is the fact that he had the presence of mind to block shots to himself rather than into the fifth row every time. That's just an insanely high level basketball move that it's a tiny wrinkle that hardly anybody would think of, but it just kind of goes to show one example of just how much of a basketball genius this guy really was. And he's frankly somebody that really has to be in the GOAT conversation every time you have it. I think that's not an exaggeration. The defense that you're talking about too, the way that he looked at the NBA game, the way that he studied his opponents and customized his defense to his opponents, the way that he incorporated principles of psychology and how he would approach the game, how getting his opponents out of whatever it was they like to do normally. It, it, it isn't just something that is impressive. It is literally how modern NBA defenses function. It, it, he, he laid the groundwork. And to say that everything that he does as a player is interconnected with who he was as a person, is interconnected with what he was as an activist, the more you dive into the life of Bill Russell, you realize why he was so dismissive of the idea of just being a basketball player, just being pigeonholed as an athlete, and why he always pushed back on those things, because all of those things tied together in his, his self in a way that is really unique, is really the only, you know, really cop out of a way to say it. Absolutely. Yeah. He was a basketball player, uh, like his, his level of basketball genius is on par with like LeBron or Kareem or Magic or anybody else who is considered to be like the smartest basketball players ever. Bill Russell is firmly in that conversation. So to, to bridge that gap, so fun, I want to talk to you about your New York Times piece. Um, but as a history teacher, I just want to ground a few things first. Um, Bill Russell's just the fifth NBA MVP to pass away. So this is a really young league we're talking about. And so as a foundational member, I, I think that's important. But then also when we talk about the era of civil rights, it's worth pointing out that Ruby Bridges, I think a name most of us all know, is only 67 years old. Um, Emmett Till would be 81 today. Uh, so we're not talking about ancient history just because the video is in black and white and people dribble differently than they do today. Um, so I just, as a history teacher, I find it useful to try to shrink the timeline because it's really not very long ago when uh, the meat and potatoes of what we're talking about took place. Um, so Sopan, you wrote a piece for the New York Times um, you called Bill a pioneer and, and activism. Um, you talked to some really interesting people. Um, so give us the, 
the TLDR of the article, and then I want to ask you about specific people that you talked to. Yeah, you know, um, when 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 the, his his passing was announced, uh, the first person I gave a call was to Al Sharpton, and Al, Al Sharpton essentially made the point that I made before, which is that you know right now activism among athletes has become trendy. Mm -hmm. um, which I think there's an element of truth to that. So for example, you know, when players, you know, uh, let, let's, let's take the 2020 bubble, right. When the, when the bucks, um, had the, had led the strike for a day or, you know, or tw two days or to, you know, in, in the wake of, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the, of, of the police shooting in, in, in Jacob Blake in Milwaukee. Yeah. You're right. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, in, in Wisconsin. Um, that was a pretty popular, stance among fans among um the league was for the most part okay with it you know it wasn't mm -hmm. like they were like you guys got to get out there and play in in 1961 when when the celtics traveled to lexington lexington kentucky to play an exhibition game and 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 the um and, and the hotel restaurant wouldn't serve the celtics black players russell immediately got up and said we're not playing the game well the white players stayed behind and played, including Bob Cousy, who 100% could have made a statement and said, well, if they're going to treat, you know, our black teammates like that, you know, and, and it goes to speak to kind of the disproportionate um, burden that non non white people have to face in terms of standing up for injustices. Right. And, and I'm, and, and so that was essentially Sharpton's point is that there, there, it it's it's it wasn't easy for Bill Russell. He faced vandalism in his home. You know, burglars broke in and 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 you know, there's feces on on his bed and and spray painted you know racial epithets epithets on his wall. Um, he wasn't, and he probably cost himself money from not being you know being you know what 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 the press would call ornery you know right. towards them. Um, he what he did as an activist was at great risk to himself. You know, I, I you know, you talk about um, after Ever Med Gavers died, um, he went to do a basketball camp in the deep South, an integrated basketball camp in the deep South after receiving death threats. He, he did it anyway. And um, I, I just think that that's a, it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible thing. I also spoke to uh, Spencer Haywood, who was, um, who played for Bill Russell uh, in, when, Bill Russell coached the Seattle Supersonics, which is, by the way, a very interesting chapter of his life, which does not get discussed very much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, Russell lived in Seattle for decades. I think he was still living there when he passed. And then he was a coach there for four years. And uh, it, I think he, he didn't do very well as a coach, but he still has a pretty big part of like Su Seattle Supersonics lore. You know, like the, in, in the four years, I think they made the playoffs and won one playoff round, which and they made the playoffs twice, which for the Seattle Supersonics is actually one of the more successful runs they probably had in, you know, in a four year stretch. But with that being said, you know, Spencer Haywood would say, you know, was telling me that, you know, Russell would take him aside and say, you know, he, he you know, and, and mentor him about activism. And, and Spencer Haywood, of course, is famous for suing the NBA. Um, and, and Russell like stood behind him and, and said, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And so it's an, it's an illustration that Russell's in, Impact was both big, for example, marching in the civil rights movement, standing behind Muhammad Ali, but it's also small, right? It's mentoring other players to, um, uh, you know, keep up with their causes. So it, I, it was a very, I, I really enjoyed having the conversations with, you know, and, and it's not just those it's guys like Etan Thomas. Etan Thomas played in the league for, I want to say about a decade. You know, he was, a, you know, a, a role player with the Washington Wizards for a while. And now he's known for activism. And he, and he said to, he said to me, um, you know, I, I want to grow up and be like Bill Russell. How many people in the world can and can can say that, you know, that that right. people are growing up wanting to be like them. And so, like, there's Eton Thomas, the activist doesn't exist without Bill Russell, the activist. So in, in that larger context of sports activism, it's so hard for us to really understand where the NBA is at in the 60s. I mean, by some measure, it's a huge deal. And other measures, you know, things are still on tape delay. Um, but Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier of 1947, I don't think anyone used the cultural context for how important that was. And your story, you actually you spoke uh, or corresponded with Spike Lee about the connection between Jackie Robinson and Bill Russell. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I wish I had something really profound to say here, but I literally texted Spike and, and then he texted that back. There, there mm-hmm. wasn't like a long conversation with Spike or anything. Um, the very funny thing about texting with Spike Lee, and I, you know, I've, I've corresponded with him um, a couple times on stories, like Nick's stories, that kind of stuff, is uh, when you text him, when he, he texts back and every single first letter of a word is capitalized. So the text I got back, if you picture it, so the text was something like, you know, I, he, um, I feel like my head's spinning with all the grapes we lost recently. You know, Bill Russell's right up there with Jackie Robinson in terms of, um, of, um, of uh, you know, act, changing, the, changing the country with activism. And, but if you picture that statement, but every single first letter of the word capitalized, that was the ex- extent of the Spike Lee text message. But to his point, look, if you're, you're going to make a Mount Rushmore, of athletes who have changed the country and the world at large, it's Jackie Robinson, right? It's Bill Russell. You know, you're probably putting, you know, Kareem on there. You know, I don't know who the fourth would be. You know, I'm open. Muhammad to Ali, that. probably. Muhammad Ali, right? Yeah. Maybe, um, you know, uh, you know, Jesse Owens. I, I don't know. You know, uh, Jesse Owens, possibly. You know, there's probably, um, you know, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of very important names, and and please don't hold me to that, but. You know, any Mount Rushmore has to include Jackie and Bill. You know, um, I'm not I'm not aware of how close the two of them were. Oh, I, I can fill in there. Um, so I, I, my next question for you was, was there anything you left out of the story that's just kind of an interesting tidbit? And one of the things that I learned and, and writing about Bill Russell um, after the fact is that after the, the 1961 uh, protest or boycott, whatever you want to call it, in Lexington, Jackie Robinson wrote a letter to Bill Russell. Um, and he thanked him for his courage. So I think prior to that, they, they weren't particularly close, but in time, they, they grew in friendship. Um, when the Celtics would travel to New York, sometimes Jackie Robinson would host the Celtics and Bill Russell, um, really quietly not making a big scene out of it. Um, and when Jackie Robinson died in 1972, um, his widow asked Bill Russell to serve as a pallbearer, um, which he did um, at funeral services. So um, I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting in watching Bill pass is seeing Shaquille O'Neal looked like a kid as seeing, you know, these cute, not just huge people, but like people that despite myself, I still really look up to suddenly shrink because they are looking up to their role model. Um, and I, I have to imagine, I, I think Bill Russell would say the same about Jackie Robinson that, you know, he looked up to Jackie Robinson. He looked up to Chuck Cooper. Um, so certainly I, they were peers from our vantage point. And I think later in life they became peers, but I would hazard that at some point, um, Bill Russell looked at Jackie Robinson the way we look at Bill Russell, which uh, is credit to, to I, And Jackie. Bill said that, I believe. I, I think Bill sure. said that in email, in interviews, that, that how much mm-hmm. he admired Jackie Robinson. I, I, um, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, Was there I, anything? I, 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 always, uh, I, I always loved... By the way, another impact here, by the way, is, you know, Bill, Bill Russell was the first Black coach mm-hmm. hired... In, in North American professional sports. And so you look at that legacy and look at, you know, all, you know, some of the black coaches that have come since then, right? Yime Adoka, you know, um, uh, you know, Willie Green, you know, it only, you know, there's been this recent, I don't want to use the word trend, but there's been, there's, there's been this recent push to hire black coaches. Um, the NBA has long had an issue with diversity and that's sure. in like as as recently as 2018. So imagine what it was like for Bill Russell, you know, to win as a you know player coach. I think he won two championships as a player coach, and then and then you know in Seattle as well. Imagine how it must have been for him to get hired as a black coach back then, because that's not in the NBA. That is no easy feat. Yeah. Now there is also a movement to get people into the executive structure of the NBA. And the West Coast Conference actually has what they call the Russell Rule, which was inspired by him, where they need to have at least one candidate of color in the pool for any position, which I think is something that needs to be instituted voluntarily, hopefully, uh, in the NBA as well. I'm not sure if that's you know, something that's building any kind of momentum, but I, I do recall that uh, during the, that, that whole Milwaukee Bucks protest bubble, all that stuff going on, uh, that that was something that was also in conversation. I'm not sure where that is at right now. I think just sorry, just to jump into this conversation really quickly. I think, you know, there's a lot of 
things about Bill Russell that people kind of remember as like a part of like old US history, right? That Bill Russell, you know, was this great player and he left this mammoth legacy and, you know, he's been kind of kicking around since then and but uh, blah, 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 blah. But there are current day NBA coaches who like worked with Bill Russell or knew Bill Russell in some capacity and very much um, like think of him as a direct inspiration to their work. Like JB Bickerstaff has repeatedly cited like the fact that his dad, Bernie Bickerstaff worked with Russell and he got to like see what that was like. Like that is, that is a driving force and just an example of how Russell's legacy is a real thing. Like it's not something that, you know, is kind of apocryphal stuff of legend. Like there are current day active NBA coaches and players who have direct lineage and connection to the legacy and achievements that Russell left behind. Bill Russell's most recent head coaching job was in 1988. I think he coached the Kings mm-hmm. for like, I mean, it didn't go well. I think he was like 17 and 41 or whatever. It was. Yeah. But like, that's not that long ago. No. Uh, you know, like this, I mean, the, the Larry Bird, Larry Bird was in his prime still when Bill Russell was still coaching in the NBA. That's you're, you're right. It's not, it's really not that long ago in, in the grand scheme of things. I think what's interesting and a transition to where we want to go next is individuals, uh, people uh, inside the halls of NBA stadiums have known Bill Russell's impact and uh, have kind of led that their whole lives. But his relationship with the league and with the city is much more checkered and, and uh, took time to kind of end up where, where it is today. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. But first, I'm just going to pause the action to talk about our friends at betonline.ag. Uh, your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. At betonline.ag, you can find the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including the MLB season, fight news, and even next season's early NFL futures. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting, playoffs, esports, and more. If you head to the website today or use your mobile device to sign up, use our promo code CLNS50 to get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's CLNS50. Um, welcome to the action, people living in Massachusetts, apparently. But online, where the game starts. So uh, the reason I, I say that uh, Bill Russell had a checkered history with the Celtics, with Boston, and um, with the NBA is, you know, at the time, in the, these are his words, not mine, the, the paper uh, uh, that kind of dominated sports news in Boston was that the Boston Herald. And at the time, it was openly against integrating the NBA. Um, and Bill Russell had to deal with that, you know, every day he had to deal with a city that has a really tough racial history. And to that end, it's not like Bill Russell stuck around in Boston um, and enjoyed a peaceful life here. He, I think very much so had as well, he might have complicated history with the fans and with the city. Um, he very famously said thanks, but no thanks to becoming the first black inductee to the Hall of Fame in the 70s. He thought that should go to Chuck Cooper. Um, so even with the NBA, you know, he wasn't uh, buddy, buddy. Um, and it's really, you know, in the past 20 years or so that he has come back to the scene. He spent the 90s kind of as a recluse in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so, so fun. I want to talk to you. You, uh, a few years ago at this point, did a mini doc for the Boston Globe um, with Darren Durlach about the statue that's in City Hall Plaza. When Alex and I went to game six, we stopped by just to say hi to Bill Russell. And it feels like, oh, that's always been a part of the city, a fabric of the city, but it's not. It's from, I believe, 2013. Uh, for context, the Red Auerbach statue um, at Faneuil Hall is from 1985. Um, so, so uh, this doc, uh, still good. Uh, really great to see Mayor Menino doing his thing. Um, but the story of the Bill Russell statue in Boston kind of bespeaks this uh, tension between Russell and his legacy and the city because it's very different even 10 years ago than it was today. So um, another too long didn't read, can you just tell us the story of how the statue ends up where it is? Well, Bill Russell, when he left Boston, I think he wrote in his autobiography that he called Boston a flea market of racism. He wanted nothing to do with the city and who could blame him? You know, when he, you know, uh, he, 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 when he moved to, um, tried to, I think it was Reading, I want to say. Yep. Had to move to, you know, he moved to Red, you know, he, when he moved to Reading, and we talked about before the vandals broke into his home. And then when he tried to move to a new town, you know, the white residents of the neighborhood, you know, started a petition to keep him out. 
um you know he he dealt with it's just just an un unenviable un, unbelievable amount of terrible terrible things a lot of vandalism a lot of taunts a lot of you know things that he should not that no one should have to deal with let alone you know you know a, a, an, an amazing athlete who had done so much for the city um so the reason that there wasn't a statue for a long time in part is because russell didn't want one he didn't enjoy playing in boston he didn't have a good relationship with the city um so from from his telling me it was just this very awkward thing where the city wanted to honor him for all he had done and he didn't care he didn't want it. he didn't want it. you guys didn't honor me when i was there why should i care now to like make yourself feel better essentially but look Boston has changed as a city since Russell played. Boston's a lot more diverse. And I'm not saying that Boston doesn't have, you know, racism, uh, you know, or systemic racism or institutional racism. You know, of course it does. Every, every city does. But it's not the same city that Russell played in in the, in, in the 60s. With that being said, um, so over time, you know, that relationship, in part because of Red Auerbach, in part because of you know the city that, that, that the very frosty relationship became warmer and they started to be willing to come to Boston and be part of you know be, be part of some events and whatnot and at some point in the 2000s I want to say around 2010 you know there was this movement to start you know building building a statue for him um, and if you haven't read it yet uh, Paul Flannery he was the former Boston Magazine writer um, he wrote a piece, you know, essentially that kind of kickstarted it. You know, why does Bill Russell have a statue in Boston? And 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 so that movement kicked up. And then at some point, I think the Celtics announced in 2011 that they were working with the city to get him one. And then I think if you were, I, I believe you on the year. I wasn't in Boston anymore at that point. But uh, then in 2013, they unveiled the city hall one. But there was a lot of interesting, you know, conversation about what should a statue of Bill Russell look like? Should it be him with children? Should it be him as a basketball player? Should it be him, you know, uh, you know the, the version that ended up being being the statue? Um, and that's an interesting and that's an interesting discussion because what should Bill Russell be commemorated at? Is it as a basketball player? Is it as a, um, you know, is it as a you know activist? Like who is Bill Russell? And and so there's a really interesting um, there's a really interesting discussion. And but finally, by the time the 2010 came around, everyone was kind of on board. It was just a question of how to properly properly do it. Yeah, I mean, if, if we look back 2008, he's on the court when the Celtics win the title. Um, that, I'm sure, mended a lot of fences in a way. The 1999 um, second uh, retirement of his jersey, I think, was really the, the sparking. Like, when he, when he came back and he saw how the city really, really did support him in a way that it didn't during his heyday there, during his time after he retired, I think that also changed his perception of where the city was at very considerably. Sure. And I, I mean, yeah, his jersey initially is retired in 1972. And anyone knows, who knows the history of Boston knows that things get more complicated, not less complicated vis-a-vis -vis race relations in the city. Um, yeah, so Bonnet, it's interesting in the doc, uh, you know, you have some people say he should be wearing a suit and tie because he's an activist. You have some people saying, you know, he should be wearing that, self, that iconic Celtics jersey. Um, and even President Obama in 2011 uh, Bill Russell receives the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and Obama says, "Hopefully, they're working on a statue." So it's it's in the zeitgeist. And you have a clip of Mayor Menino, who I'm not going to say anything <laughs> other than he's, he always gives a good interview. He says, "Well, hopefully, you know, President Obama coughs up the money." So even just the funding of the statue, I mean, Mayor Menino couldn't help himself, maybe, but uh, is contentious. Um, and I think that that's an interesting uh, footnote that. Even the idea of honoring Bill Russell, what that looks like is, is not easy. Um, if, if they're going to build a Kevin Garnett statue, it's probably going to be him in a basketball uniform with respect to Kevin Garnett. But the Bill Russell one is much more uh, complicated. And um, there's a quote here about Bill Russell. Bill, Justin, can you give us this quote of <laughs> Bill Russell's thoughts on statues? So he famously said two things about statues. First, they remind me of tombstones. And second, there's something, <laughs> <laughs> they're for, there's something for pigeons to crap on, which I think is his way of saying things that he has said his entire 
you know, life that he isn't just a basketball player, for one thing. I don't think he was entirely comfortable with being portrayed as a basketball player, given he didn't want to be seen just as a basketball player his whole life. Uh, and also, he doesn't necessarily, I don't, I don't want to speak for him, I don't think he thought that being an activist, uh, even in of itself, and all the amazing things that he did, was something that, that necessarily should be celebrated so much because in his view, in my eyes, I think that he thinks it's something we should all be trying to do. Fair. So, uh, so on a few more things, then we'll get you out of here. Um, again, from someone who has done the history, has, has looked into this, but then again, also we have anthropologists and history teachers. I'm curious what people think might be missing from the public view of Bill Russell. Um, I, I, I'll reiterate kind of, sure, I'll reiterate kind of what I said just to give people time to think, which is that the, the time horizon feels ancient. Um, I say to my students, don't be lulled to sleep because camera technology has changed so much so quickly um, that the things that we're talking about that Bill Russell had to deal with in the 60s and 70s, had to deal with in 2011, 2013, it looks so different because technology was different, but that doesn't mean people were different. That doesn't mean that the people that we know and have met have lived this experience. Um, so I think that that's something that is hard to, to grapple with every step of the way is that a grainy video from 1961 of Bill Russell jumping over someone as should be just as impressive as when I jump over people in our men's league Alex or something like that. Um, so that would be my thing is that writ large when we talk about the past, the camera technology can be uh, distracting. Um, so anyways, so but I'll go with you first. What's the thing about the Bill Russell story or I guess historical narratives that maybe we're missing? You know, uh, look, I, I don't think there's much people don't know about his activism. I don't think there's much people don't know about as the player. You know, it's like, that's out there. I actually think what's kind of amazing about Russell is um, he's very funny. He had a great, I mean, yeah. I don't know if you guys watched uh, I, I, the cameo that started circulating uh, on Sunday uh, of him in Miami Vice. I mean, it, it was pretty funny. I mean, it was really like, you know, oh, yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's, I mean, when he did the middle finger uh, to Charles Barkley, when uh, he's on stage with the other uh, guys, um, I think Kareem, Shaq, and, Bay, yeah. and he's pointing at either, either of them and says, I could still kick your ass, you know, that's funny, he, he, and he has some very funny tweets too, um, uh, he was, a, I, I, that gets kind of, he's such an infectious laugh too, yep. Big time. Um, he, uh, those are, he just seems like a, a, a look, he wasn't like, uh, look, obviously his activism and encore play is really important, but like, we should remember that he was a human too and he's a very funny human. I love that. Yeah, his laugh. Uh, I tweeted out some outtakes he did with, for AT&T commercials and this laugh is just, I hope that some way someone waxes poetic about my laugh. I don't think it's going to happen. But, <laughs> um, Justin and then Alex, anything just that's been knocking around your head about Bill Russell? Yeah, definitely. Uh, long time listeners, viewers uh, probably can recall a certain interview we had with Matt Sullivan about uh, Kyrie Irving linking up with uh, Bill Russell out on the West Coast in Seattle in the Seattle basketball scene and how that meeting had a lot to do with Kyrie leaving and a lot of what Kyrie has done since. And at the time, I, I even found it, you know, like, holy crap, did this even really happen? Not, not challenging Sullivan's, you know, reporting, but it was just right. a lot to swallow at the time. It took the internet by storm and really created a lot of disbelief, uh, this distaste, I guess you could say, for, for Kyrie kind of went up a, a further notch, like, wow, he's leaving because of racism. And he... he Probably uh, in my mind, you know, after reviewing the life of Russell and a lot of the things that rub people the wrong way in Russell's career, not wanting to sign autographs, awkward relationships with the media, complicated at best relationships uh, over race in the city of Boston. And then realizing that these two were, were sharing life stories, experiences and such it really recently have, has caused me to look at the Kyrie experience. And I am not talking about the vaccination stuff. I'm yeah. not talking about how he 
has articulated these feelings and a lot of other things, but explicitly those things I just mentioned, I just want us to, you know, maybe go back and revisit those, those exchanges, experiences, moments, et cetera, in light of Bill Russell's life. And just think about, you know, how hard it is to follow in the footsteps of someone like Russell and how easy it is to screw it up. And without necessarily forgiving Kyrie for whatever other things you might be upset with him about if you are, just maybe put that in a little bit of context. Alex, anything uh, that you missed or that we missed? You know, it, it's just kind of staying in that same vein. One thing that I think is really important to think about with Russell is how much he meant to kind of the greats of the game. There's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, people who kind of talk about like in the GOAT debate, who's their guy or the top 10 player list, things like that. But all of those guys thought thought the world of Bill Russell. I looked over some interviews that he had with KG and Tim Duncan, two of his favorite players from the 2000s. And you could see the reverence that those guys had when they were speaking with him. They, they were like really awestruck by his presence and the fact that not only he was just talking to them and giving them the time of day, but that he also considered those guys, Duncan and KG specifically, to be some of his favorite players, that really was an immense, meaningful thing for them. Like KG was visibly emotional and overcome in that interview. And I think it just kind of goes to show like whoever you think is the quote unquote greatest of all time in that debate or the whoever you think is your top five, whatever, all of those guys, your LeBrons, your Duncans, your KGs, like all of those guys think that Bill Russell is in that group, is in that top spot. Like Michael Jordan thought Bill Russell was the greatest of all time. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar thought Bill Russell was the greatest of all time. I'm sure LeBron thinks similarly. And it, it just kind of goes to show, I think one of the things about basketball is that one of the easiest ways to tell when a player is good is how the other good players think about them. And mm -hmm. if the other good players think that this dude can hoop, he can probably hoop. And to a man, every single one of the players that we think of as great now, as great in the 2000s, as great in the 90s, as far back as the 80s, all of them unilaterally to a man believe that Bill Russell is and remains one of the greatest players who's ever set foot on a basketball court. And I think it's a fitting way to remember him in addition to his mammoth presence as an act activist, as an icon and advocate for justice, and just as a human being. So, so fun we brought you on because we love your writing and I recommend people check out your New York Times piece. Um, Justin, we keep you around because we love your writing and I really appreciate it what you wrote um, over at Celtics Wire. Um, but I was thankful that you were really emotionally honest with that one. Um, speaking of writing, I just, I've said it before on this podcast, one of my favorite sports books of all time is Red and Me, the book that Bill Russell wrote about his relationship with Red Auerbach. Um, maybe in another podcast, we could unpack all of that, but that's just such an interesting part of um, his legacy. So just in the interest of good writing, there's three things for people to check out for homework. Um, so, Pan, uh, we'll get you out of here on this. And I want to pick Alex and Justin's brain as well. What happens next with um, remembering Bill Russell? I offered that maybe they'll retire his number or maybe they ought to retire his number league-wide. He's already attached to the NBA MVP trophy. I mean, it's not like he doesn't have a lot of laurels to rest on, but um, what do you think might happen next or ought to happen next in continuing to memorialize Bill Russell? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, in terms of retiring his number across sports, uh, excuse me, across the whole sport, um, you know, it's a little complicated. Sure. As, you know, uh, LeBron wears numbers. Do Dr. J too. Uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of amazing, you know, and look, whatever you can say about LeBron, his, his consequence as, as, a, as, you know, look, Bill Russell's had a huge consequential impact, off, of course, as a player and as an activist, and no one's downplaying that. And, but LeBron, when he ends his career, it's possible, if not already, that he will be looked at as the unequivocal best player of all time. Right. And so is it necessarily fair 
to say that number six should only be associated with Bill Russell. And I'm not, I, I don't know the answer to that. And I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. I just think it's more complicated than that. Um, but I, I just don't think there's a way to fully honor Bill Russell. It's just impossible. Yeah. It's just an impossible thing to do. I mean, do you give him more statues? Sure. You know, you've already named a trophy after him, right? You've already, um, he already has the presidential medal of freedom. You know, what is, what's left? To give Bill Bill Russell at this point, if you really want to truly honor Bill Russell, it's to spend your life in whatever way you can, um, standing up to injustice and spotlighting it when you can. That's the way to do it. Um, giving him more um, physical honors, I'm not sure that he. I'm not sure that that's necessarily something. Um, I'm not sure there's anything left to give him. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm just not sure. I'm not. I'm sure people will think of creative ways to do it, but I'm just. You know, he I'm just give him sure. away for charity as he did yeah. the rest of them. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have I just, a thought. Yeah, uh, with regard to that, which is that I I agree. I think that honoring Bill Russell physically is probably an impossible task, but I do think that there is something that not the entire league can do, but specifically the Boston Celtics can do. Um, and I think that it's frankly been time to do this. And uh, I'm kind of just thinking of it now, but it strikes me as. A, a kind of logical way for the Celtics to honor specifically the fact that there would be no Boston Celtics without Bill Russell. Like they would, they, it's very questionable that they would exist as a team. Bill Russell came to the Celtics and they became a dominant franchise. Maybe if there is no Bill Russell, there is yeah. arguably no Boston Celtics to this day. And to that end, I don't, I don't think that this would happen, but I think an appropriate thing for the Celtics to do that would honor the mammoth legacy that Russell should leave with their franchise is to name the freaking building after Bill Russell. The TD Garden Bank North Arena is a crappy (laughs) name for an arena. Name it the Bill Russell Arena because he built that shit. (laughs) I don't think the Celtics own the building though, right? Oh yeah, Delaware North owns it. They don't, but they should build their own arena, which I wrote about this week. Oh. Yeah. In any situation. Wait, you don't like TD, where TD is? You don't like it. it's not I about the it's, location. It's 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 you know this this little sentimental bit aside. Um, they can't print money in the same way that some of their, yeah, their elite competitors do in the same same vein. I just I think if you want to honor Bill Russell to the leg to the level that you would need to actually do it, you need to literally name the arena after him. And I know that it's unrealistic to think that, that would happen, especially because, frankly, the Bruins owner who has the bigger stake in the building is kind of a crappy guy but um I, I i don't i don't think it's going to happen but that would be in my mind appropriate i think i want to add to that is bill russell was very big on mentorship he started an organization called mentor that grant williams is you know carrying the, the torch for now uh if the league could try to institute a league wide program uh within the organization to kind of unite the other thing i was talking about earlier the russell rule that the west coast conference has whether the nba has or has not something like that in the works i i'm sorry i wish i knew more about this a mentorship program to get more people in to the ranks of the front offices of the league into coaching of the league, which is doing good, but the front office is the new, the next frontier, the next level of importance in the NBA. Uh, that is something I would like to see happen. Sure. So with respect to physical changes and creative honorees, I think so fun you're right that the best way to honor Bill Russell's legacy is to do something in your interpersonal life. Um, so that's really the homework assignment. Go read people's stories and read some books. There's a lot we, we do day to day that I think Bill Russell would admire more than naming buildings or blocking out jerseys. Um, so, so on Dev, people can find you at New York Times, uh, and you have some projects in the work that they should definitely keep an eye out for. Um, everyone else, thanks for listening, like and subscribe, and we will talk to you soon. Adios.